listening to the PR Wind Down Podcast, the show for public relations professionals who are ready to see real change in the PR industry. We are your hosts, April White and Laura Schooler. Let's get ready to wind down. All right, Laura, do you want to read our anonymous PR horror story of the week? Okay. Where is it? Hold. Oh, here it is. Okay. I worked for a large company that did a number of different types of announcements and events. And I worked in the, what does it say here? The corporate communications department. It was possible that I could be working on a bunch of different kinds of things at any given time, but there was no way that I would ever be able to work on everything that was going on at the company at once. My company did a big national slash international event, but I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't working on it at all. And the next day I came back to work and my boss asked if I had both seen on television the event and gotten a full clip of the event. And when I said I saw some of it and no, I didn't have a clip, he hit the roof. Now, it was not something that I worked on for even one second. He then called me and his assistant into his office. And in between him yelling at me and calling us into his office, I told her quickly to get this clip. So by the time we both got into his office and he started yelling at the both of us, she was able to say that she was or- already had ordered the, the clip. While she was telling him this, she was playing with her hair. She had braids. In the middle of a sentence of her telling him that she had gotten this clip, he said, oh my God, what are you doing? That is so annoying. Stop touching your hair. (laughs) I realized sitting next to her didn't even know that she was even touching her hair. It was one of those mindless things that she was doing. And so she put her hand down and we continued to be berated by him as he began talking to her, she mindlessly started touching her braid again and he hit the roof and kicked us out of his office. He was so furious at her for touching her own hair in his presence. Wow. So what is worse about that story that this person was so unhinged that some woman touching her hair would send him into a rage or that he was yelling at two people who had nothing to do with whatever this project was. It seems kind of the same issue, right? He just wanted somebody to, to target with his fury and just mm-hmm. unleashed it. I mean, I've been in a situation more than once and I think we all have, where you have gotten blamed for something that you had very little or nothing to do with in a PR job. Yeah. You can, you can either be the kind of person who just takes it, you could be the kind of person who yells back, or anywhere in between, but it doesn't really matter. And I think to the point of what you're saying is it's because it has nothing actually to do with you or the, the issue that's being yelled about. Because no right. rational person Mm-mm. would do that. Mm-mm. So is it just because these people are like miserable human beings who hate the sight of their own face? Probably. And they're just going to take out their nonsense on the people yeah, around I mean, it's them? Yeah, I think so. It's just a lack of empathy and a total disregard for responsibility of one's own job, one's own responsibilities, one the, one's own emotions and response, right? I mean, I think anybody who who thinks it's okay to have an emotional reaction or any kind of reaction and vomit all over other people that's not taking responsibility for yourself as a human being so I mean if this whatever project thing was these people's responsibility I suppose they could get a talking to but this like furnace blast and being thrown out of this person's office because of some combination of not doing something they were supposed to do anyway and a woman touching her hair. Well, and this was probably a response, like a nervous tick, right? It may like, have been. It's probably like, oh my God, I'm getting yelled at. Oh my God, I'm getting yelled at. You know, soothing like her. A comfort, right. Yeah. Right. 
Like, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm getting yelled at. You're blasting me like a maniac for something that I didn't even have any, you know, responsibility for. And now you're yelling at me because my reaction is to try to like, yeah, console myself while I'm sitting here while you're exploding all over. Oh my God. I mean, there's just been so many stories like this. It's very sad to me. I guess this stuff still must happen. I mean, I don't know. Maybe this happened recently too. Yeah, we don't have any any idea of the con the context or the timeline. There's no Hillary Clinton reference in this one. No, there's no little Hillary Clinton pantsuit. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Wow. So, what advice do we have for people that would be in a similar situation and getting yelled at? I mean, I think you just. Too. Like I said, since it has nothing to do with you and the person that you work for is a, obviously a maniac, you just gotta like duck and cover and keep it moving and try to find another job. I mean, it's, yeah, I, it's sad, but this this beha- like I've said before, this kind of behavior is not actionable in a legal way, right? Uh, unless there was like serious, you know, uh, putting these people down because of their race or religion or sexual orientation or gender right. or whatever. And telling it's, HR is not going to help anything. No. Just because somebody is a jerk is not illegal. Yeah. But I mean, in that, it's too bad because in that uh, atmosphere, it's impossible to work. How can you work when you're like, mm-hmm. you know, under that sort of cloud of doom? Right. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm apologizing to, to, the, whoever. to all of the little people who have to endure this kind of nonsense. <laughs> I mean, not that you can't get treated like crap when you're older, but I just feel like it's not as impressionable or damning. Yeah, that's true. When you're older, you can just be like, okay, dude. Well, and you all, I mean, that just goes back to the thing that I've said before to people, which I don't think I've said directly on this podcast, but I think, you know, when you're younger and you're in some sort of a dysfunctional relationship, you put up with it for way too long because you're trying to figure out if it's you or if it's or what the problem is and then I've had a similar experience being older at agencies and the last one I think I I told you I don't want to mention names I was there for a hot second and it was just long enough to be like yeah I know how this ends right I'm good I've seen this movie before I don't need to see it again I was like bye and peace out like this is it it's a wrap put a fork in it it's done yeah or at least uh you don't take it personally and it is going to define you as a human being. Right. So you get better and better and faster and faster at yeah. pulling the ribcord. <laughs> right. Hey, it looks like Ed is joining. He's our guest. Oh, great. Cool. Let him in. So today we're joined by Ed Zitron. He's from Easy PR. He's the author of This Is How You Pitch, an early PR person's guide to PR, and Fire Your Publicist, a DIY guide to PR for just about anyone. So we're going to have some great conversations with Ed about the future of PR, creating lasting relationships with journalists, and the media relations he has done with his own two hands. So welcome, yep. Ed. Hello. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Hi. We'd love to hear a little bit more about these books. They uh, yes. Yeah, so... They sound a little brazen and, and totally our style. Uh, there's, the first one was written kind of as a thing to send back in time to myself because it was a bunch of stuff that, frankly, nobody to this day has said in other PR books, it, something irresponsible about PR for me is the prevalence of people in it who are talking heads who don't do the job. And very few <laughs> of them have any interest in actually putting down how to do the job or what the job entails. I took my first PR job based on the author. I'm not going to name him because it, I mean, obviously it will out in my first boss. I read his book and thought this PR thing sounds great. And I went to work for him. It's like, oh, completely made up then. Just falsehoods. Because everyone wants it to seem like press conferences and fun stuff. And, oh, everyone wants to speak to you. As we all know, that is not the case. (laughs) So I wrote that just because I felt like junior PR people had nothing. And they still, I would argue, do not. I'm actually rewriting. I'm rewriting. I'm making a, a new edition of it. At some point soon, I have all this work to do. Otherwise, I just write books all day, which would make me a lot like the people like David Merriman Scott, who hasn't done PR in like 15, 20 years. And he has one of the best selling PR books. Makes no sense to me. Truly awful. <laughs> and Fire Your Publicist is just because I routinely get asked, what should I do in to do publicity? And I thought I may as well put that down 
I've written it in various forms in various times. So it's like, fine, whatever, I'll just do it. And yeah, I didn't really do PR around that book. I'll be completely honest, just because, I don't know, the business is going well. So I wasn't particularly worried about making money from it. But it's out there and people really sells. So what are, uh, what are some of the big <laughs> pearls of wisdom that you are sharing with? Big thing with the first one with uh, this how you pitch was I put down exactly what you'll be doing every day, which seems very obvious to those of us already doing the job. To people in the first few years, and I get constantly, I hear this from people, where it's like, wow, I thought I was just weird thinking this was bad. I thought it was weird that I felt bad forming, form pitching people. So spamming people, spamming 100, 200 people with the same email without looking at who they were or trying to target it to them. And it's really interesting and also dis, makes me despair how often that happens because there are tons of PR people who don't want to do that, who are forced to by charlatans. And these charlatans range from small shops all the way up to the big, the big ones. I mean every one of the major multinationals. The spam there is awful and it's always the young'uns who get put into it. They always get shoved into this thing of like, oh yeah, you've got to spam all these reporters and if you have a big enough client, it works and you think that that means it's good. When something working that's still bad, I'm not talking about politics, I'm not talking about Congress, but something can still exist for many years while sucking extremely hard. <laughs> Right. So yeah, right. If you have a, if you have a client, that's a big enough name that'll get covered anyway. Yeah. They'll, they'll just you, talk to you because you reached out to them, but you have no idea yeah. because you are such a savvy. Uh, it isn't because writer. you are such a savvy. Like right. I, I, right. not to say that any of my clients are not of high notoriety, but they're not multinationals who just get right. pressed by existing. It's not and that's, or something. Right. Yeah. And even then, oh God, I can't imagine doing PL for something like even food, but Coca-Cola. Oh, that makes me sad inside. But just they, those, and those companies like have beat reporters. So they have people who like yeah, cover exactly. them all the time. Yeah. And at that point you're doing more, you're running more interference than you are doing media relations. Yeah. You're yeah. mostly trying to make stuff not happen. Right. Or you're trying to make very specific stuff happen. Right. Yep. No, but it's interesting because the assumption is you can be too early for media relations if you're like a seed round company yep. and you don't really have a customer base yet. And you may not even have an MVP, um, minimum viable product yet. Then you're too early. But I am yet to find a company that is too late. And in fact, I think every single one of these Fortune 500 ones could get something with the exception of like an insurance company. Like an insurance company, I've done PR for insurance companies. Don't, make, don't do it, just don't bother. Get investor relations, stick with that. It's, it's interesting, and I am obviously very media relations focused, that the PR industry as a whole as well, and I make this point in both my books, seems anti-media relations, despite the fact that it's, pretty much consistently what every company wants. They are very against it. And I have numerous theories, both conspiratorial and otherwise, as to well, why explain. I think that is. Yeah, explain what you mean by that. So I think to make a lasting relationship with someone requires, in the media at least, in real life too, requires a level of understanding and empathy and research that most PR people do not want to do and do not see the value of. They... It's impossible not to be in transactional on some level, mm -hmm. but journalists aren't stupid. They're not going to be like, oh, this PR person just wants to be my friend, son. Like, of course, they know. But you can still build a relationship with someone and never pitch them or pitch them once. I have a reporter at New York Times who I have run several stories with, and I knew her from her job at Bloomberg for years. I never pitched her. No, sorry, I did once in 2017. Run two stories with her this year. And that was because I've read pretty much everything she does, but also waited and not forced anything. Right. I think right. that, a lot, and it's just basic humanity, but I think a lot of PR people find the relationship building difficult. They find the learning difficult. I've been at two different PR agencies and I'm none of the PR people who are like this, who actually loathe knowledge. They think that knowing too much gets in the way of the pitch. And as someone who has been running a multi-million dollar agency, since 2012 through several 
ups and downs. It works. Journalists like it when you know things. And I've seen this a lot. And I hear this story. I get the younger PR people telling me this. There is this view that to be the right PR person, you need to be charming and all this, but also kind of stupid. You need to like know just enough. When that's called lying or sociopathy, you should be reading everything so you have a rounded knowledge of the world around you. And the offshoot of that is that you're able to talk to a lot of people. I should also add, and it doesn't sound like I'm sympathetic at all, but I really am. This is not something taught in college, and it's certainly not something taught by management. Well, that's I what think, I was going to say. Yeah, how, how do, so. how, uh, why does this, like, why do you think this happens? And how, how um, because like you said, it's like these junior people go into these <laughs> agencies, and they're just like shoved into these positions and told what to do by their, you know, senior leadership or maybe just their manager, depending on how big the, uh, you know, the agency is. And they're told, this is what you do. This is how you do it. And let me see a report at the end of every day that shows me how many people you, I, they don't have a choice. In, important addition or subtraction from that. Yeah. This is how you do it is definitely not something they're told. So you were completely <laughs> That's right. True. That's true too. You're completely right. <laughs> they're actually they're not thrown... told anything. <laughs> no. And so what happens is PR is a really unique job. I sound like a, hey, I love my job. But the one of the biggest things with PR is in PR jobs, it seems the people who rise to the top are the ones who are good at not getting fired. And <laughs> this, like is a, this is a knowledge worker problem, but it's really specific in PR. Because what PR people like to do is one of the reasons they don't hire that many people is they love to say, my team did this. I have been on no fewer than eight interviews in the last five years, and I don't interview many people. And none of them got the job, surprisingly, where they've said, my team, and I've said, cool, stop right there. I'm going to stop you there. My team is not what I want to hear. I want to, you do. Well, my team. I'm like, awesome, great, don't care. You, what did you do? Well, I was managing someone who I'm like, okay, cool, great, you can stop right there. End of the sentence all the information gone there. What did you do? And so few PR people that I've talked to, if you're managing someone and taking credit for their work, that is not work. That's theft. To round off the point, the big problem is most of the people in managerial positions in PR don't do the work anymore. They don't do it. So how, as a manager who doesn't do the work that you're assigning to people, do you say if someone's good or bad? Other than result came out, how do you grow their career? How do you help them? How do you get them through a tough week or a tough month or a tough year? How do you train them? How do you, and of course, you never train them to exceed you because that might get you fired because you don't do anything. But also a lot of these <laughs> PR agencies, they're structured in such a way that it's usually three or four ringers in like a 15, 25 person shop. There's like a VP, maybe the CEO, and their, their goal, their career tra trajectory has always been, how can I get paid the most amount of money for the least amount of work? Ideally, no work. And how can, when I get yelled at, for, I find someone to yell at quickly? Right. If and, somebody's going to get fired, it won't be me. It'll be... Oh, yeah. It rolls down. downhill, everyone. That's where it's going. It's going to hit you. And <laughs> I think it comes down to a poison within management culture within PR. I think that one is very obvious, but also I think PR education is despicably bad. I mean, I cannot think of a sit. I have bought seven or eight of these buddies. Oh, God, now maybe six of these textbooks. And I've read through them. It's like none of this is relevant. I've been in PR since two thousand and eight. I've done maybe three of these things. Why are you talking about press conferences? No one does these. <laughs> you do it when you're going to do a press conference. Right, right, especially now, right. And you, it's, the, it's a problem with college as a whole. I do not believe college educates people for real life. But PR education especially, it doesn't just fail to educate them. It gets their hopes up. It makes you think you're going to be important. I don't care about anyone thinking I'm cool or important. I care about getting work done. So wait. How did go. Oh, wait, you're going to ask the same question. You're, you're going to ask the same question I'm going to ask. Are we? Oh. Are you sure? Let's find out. Yeah. We said at the same time? No, just go and I'll tell you if it was wrong. <laughs> okay. How did you teach yourself to do media relations if you had nobody above you? Was it That was not what I was going to ask him. Go ahead. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, we have two questions then. So, a few things. One, I came to New York in like 2008. 
And I got there and I saw four people get fired in like the first month. Great thing to see. And I was awful at the job because no one had told me what to do. There was a fellow called Jeff Lavari, who's a wonderful fellow, who gave me some direction. He himself was under a tremendous amount of pressure, but I begged him. I was like, I want to stay in America. I don't want to go back to England. I hate it there. And I begged him and he was like, all right, let me, and he gave me kind of a gimme contact, like just someone who was always fairly game to talk to anyone. And he's like, you want to talk to these people and get to know them. All my bosses, managers and all that, they were like, you got to write everything into the pitch. It's got to be 300, 400 words. It's got to have everything. Horrible advice. I was like 22. How the hell was I meant to know differently? But it was going against everything in my brain. My brain was boiling every right, day. You're thinking like, this is not how people this does, actually work. This doesn't make sense. Right, Why do right. my managers keep correcting what I'm saying? So I think I got like an ebook reader, like an early e-reader. And I just thought, ah, screw it. I was going to write what I want. Well, they could, I don't care anymore. And it worked. I did like two or three sentences. And they're like, oh, this is really good. Yeah. And I thought, what if I did that elsewhere? If I just sent two or three sentences for each thing. And it kept working. And I went, oh. And then I started meeting these journalists for drinks. And they were saying that, hey, PR people. And I asked why. And they told me. And I said, okay. I just didn't do that. Mostly it was just don't call them. Journalists hate being called. I don't really had call them on the phone. On the telephone. Right. They hate cold calling. They hate cold emails as well, but everyone does. But they hate cold calling, which everyone does as well. And I have been I haven't made a cold call since 2014, 15. And that was a bloke called Will over Inc. who told me to cold call him. So but stuff like that, I just kind of listened to the reports because all my managers seem to be very bad at getting media relations hits. And very good at telling me to get them. And so <laughs> I just, I did not see the math that they get right, one. It makes sense. If they couldn't yeah. get them, why would you take their advice? If they could get them, why wouldn't they just do it? But they, I eventually, I progressed from good to pretty damn good. And then when, oh, I'm getting most of the hits for the agency. So I'm just going to do what I want. So a manager would be like, can I read your pitch? I'd say, no. And there would be a very awkward conversation. They'd come yell at me, raise their voice. I'd say, not listening. <laughs> Big argument. Manage, it's a management culture thing in general. In any industry, you mean? Yeah. yeah. The, there are always people who exist, the middle managers who exist to claim other people's work and use it as building blocks to get to the next level of middle management so they can then actually be a middle manager of middle managers, <laughs> which is... It's the, the premise dream. of the movie That's, Office Space, basically, yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very confusing, but nevertheless, that's kind of how I got good at it. And then I moved on to another agency where I was given a lot more freedom. And by which I mean, I didn't get micromanaged. I was just told, right. here are your clients, be on the calls, talk to them, understand what they want. And yeah, I still, everyone still whiffs. Sometimes you don't get the results you expect, but it's replicable and it's good and the journalists don't mind because i'm not bringing them stuff they hate bringing them stuff they're like oh cool yeah that's relevant to my interests wow what a novel thought right and even if they're not going to write about it you're not wasting their time you're and actually very information good piece of advice if you get told no go out gracefully i never understood this with pr people they argue like, with the journalists. Right. yeah like if a journalist well, says it's no usually because your boss or manager is like they said no ask them why not and it's like <laughs> my clients ask still ask them, that what difference is it me well my they clients no. ask that sometimes and i'm just them? like depends on the thing if it's like i had one today who got feedback from new york times reporter and the new york times reporter basically said you being famous is not a story you being successful <laughs> is not a story and i passed that on and the client actually took it very well he was totally fine with it. I've had times where the client, they've just said no. And, and they've said, and the client said, well, why? I'm not, and I will, depending on how arsy I'm feeling that day, I might say, I don't know, you ask them. Or I'm not them, I don't know. But for the most part, I just tell them what I think it is. Right. And if they say, right. can you ask them? I say, no. Right. Because people hire me, these are PR, because they know, we know the reporters. I'm not going to piss off a reporter by going to them and saying, hey, <laughs> Give me the answer. And honestly, half the time it's, 
I don't have time for this and I'm not going to in the future. Right. It's exhausting, but it's also because yeah. the young people going into this who are doing the media list, for example, they're only being taught to look for keywords. Oh, you've mentioned agriculture before. That means you're the person. Mm, read a little deeper. Or they've mentioned they've covered big agriculture or companies. Do they cover startups? No, they do not. Right. But no one teaches people to do this. No one well, the expectations, teaches them. I feel like uh, <laughs> their managers are saying, build a media list with 200 people by, you know, this afternoon. So of course you're going to just shortcut it. You know, you don't have time to do something thoughtful. It would make more sense to have a thoughtful list of 20 than a not thoughtful man- list of and- 200. So when did you start your own firm or whatever you refer 2012. to? 2012. And you, I mean, I can guess why you did it, but you tell us why you did. Money. No, it's not just money, but. That wasn't what I was going to get. I mean, no, but you know what? I will say this. I don't do it. Right. I do it for the money because it's a job. Like that's what everyone does. Right. I, it's, I'm not a vet. Like I don't. I, just, nevertheless, yes, I did it for the monetary reasons, you mean but a also vet, veterinarian. Yeah, yeah, you care about the pets, and you're yeah. right. You love animals. I mean, honestly, both, both, both are both are vocational, both, both are callings, and both involve life and death. Uh, <laughs> unlike PR. Um, but anyways, moving on. I started my agency because also I wanted the autonomy. I was yeah. there was always a layer of, and I had a manager who was taking my coverage and claiming it was his. And it was just like, I don't. And then I entered the point in my career where I knew exactly how much money I was bringing in for the agency and how much work I was doing, like 95% of it. And then how much I was being paid. And I was like, I, I don't. That doesn't work. And just, and like any job, I was getting tired of that job. And I think it was just the right time. And yeah, I wanted to make the money that I felt I was worth. What, are there, what other advice do you have for young PR professionals? Since that's a big component of our, um, of our listeners, or at least- Read. Read. <laughs> read. Read way more than- the other day. But I don't mean read books. I don't mean read the New York Times. If you're pitching tech publications, read every single damn one of them. Yeah. Don't just read The Verge, read Engadget, read Slash Gear. Read tech, go to tech meme and click every bloke. Like, I don't, you don't want to read the same article from five different places. You want to read five different articles from five different places. Read, follow the writers on Twitter. Don't be creepy. Don't go on the Instagram and go, oh, I love your dog. Looks like you're having fun. They do that though. I get, I get those pictures occasionally. I'm like, I still get pitched as well. I don't know why. Yeah. But read, reading, 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 reading. When you pitch a reporter, you're going to do that pitch. If you're not 100% confident, read a little more. Because guess what? It'll probably, and if you find out, if you get there and you're like, this isn't for them, I shouldn't pitch them, don't. Mm-hmm. Totally fine to not do that. And indeed, when we can go outside again and we all have the vaccine, try and meet the reporters for a cup of coffee and just listen. Ask them what they want to hear about. Because the reporter will tell you. And yeah, there are going to be many cases where the reporter doesn't know, and that's not their job to tell you. If they do, it's very nice of them. Reading is right. And also, domain expertise, please understand what you're talking about. If you loathe knowledge, you're a loathsome person. And you don't need to learn stuff for fun just to like show it off to people. Find something you're interesting, interested in and be interested in something. Don't just learn facts read around something get interested in something if you don't have that in your life and it happens to a lot of young people please i beg of you find something i don't care what it is as long as you're not hurting anyone get into do music you, get yeah you let's just full, read more do you have full-time employees who work i do i've got three of them and you also um have freelance employees that you use uh, occasionally yeah are they spread around or are they yeah, all in uh, Vegas? But, Boston, San Francisco, and New York. And so when you started your agency, where, was that, you, you, like even back in 2012, was that the model? It was just me at first. And then I learned after two years, I cannot do this alone. Yeah. I, need, I need to delegate some stuff or I need someone who can do stuff how I do it because otherwise I will burn out. And I did, I burned out. I had a, and so I hired a chief of staff, which gave me an organizational layer I needed. 
And then you know, several months after that, I, I hired Kevin, who's been incredible. And then a few years after that, I had Trevor. And it's, it's one of those things where you can't do this alone, but don't get people just to say you have people. And what kind of, uh, do you have a specific industry that you focus on? Usually tech startups, uh, we will do quite deep enterprise B2B because in a lot of those cases, it is just a case of, have you learned enough things? Are you able to condense information well and get it to the right people? I really want to take, if I could dream up a client to take, I want some of these PC manufacturers. All their PR firms are awful. Awful, awful. I could just none of them watch any of like Gaming Nexus or uh, Linus. They don't. They don't know what they're talking about. It drives me insane. Do you go after them? It's really difficult doing outgoing new business. I don't really do it much. I get incoming business. I think about going after them, but it's tough because when you find the person who hired the agency, usually that person doesn't want the agency to go because the agency goes, they look bad. Right. It's like a management. Right, or it's like they brought that agency in because it was their friend or they used to work there or something, yeah. Exactly. There are so many big agency-held accounts that if they ever, if anyone ever breaks that hold and all of that money falls out, it will possibly destroy these agencies. That's why so many of them have focused on managed services. It's why they're focused on, oh, I now, like now we do, we have a more managed services are the wrong, like add-on services, like, oh, we have a videographer. Oh, we have an artist. Oh, we can get someone to do your ads because they know they have crap at the actual PR stuff. Like ads, videos, that isn't PR. Stop no, it. Just, but they're it, part of like an ad agency and they can sort of bring those people in and yeah. keep bringing in money and keep the client there even though it's not even what and, they yeah. do. Even yeah. though they're unhappy with the core service, they have a right. lot of documents. PR firms love documents. You want some documents, PR firm if you want 19 pages about yeah. three things. Right. Ed, have you, have you also noticed the PR people that um, really, really are into developing relationships with their clients tend to be the ones that actually don't know what they're doing? Yes. It's more, it, I call it cat littering. Just <laughs> around. It's... They love talking to their guy. God, they love getting on a call. Oh, do you want to get on a call? Oh, yeah. I love to get on a call and talk straight. Brainstorm. If it's, we need to come up with marketing ideas and we have this budget. We need, we have money to spend. That's not the same as, let's all think of things. On your regular call, you could do the act of brainstorming. Right. You could have a conversation and be like, oh, what do you think about this? And the client could say something. You go, oh, that's cool. If you set up a brainstorming session, it's always going to be, counterproductive just because I, spent, I was on back at the agency at last agency I worked for I was on like an 11 person brainstorming meeting just no no content just words right someone brought up doing something in Times Square I was so glad I was muted for the words that came out of my mouth but it's the client relationship stuff <laughs> is really common that whole idea of just the client likes me so they'll pay me sure if I have a choice between a client paying me and not paying me, I would choose pay me. But if your job is trying to basically manipulate someone to stay in a relationship with, with you, well, I, I challenge you to put that in a more social context or like a romantic relationship and tell you how you sound. <laughs> Does it sound good what you're doing? And, but it's, it's a manipulative thing. And there are also people who are just like, oh, I'm great at client management. That just means you're good at making people feel better at bad stuff. When do you think that it's time to sort of cut and run with cl a client relationship to sever it? Good question. I mean, you'll know. Whenever, when you start dreading a call, when you start like losing sleep over the next call, unless there's an event where you screwed up and you know it's going to be a bad conversation, that's just living. But if every client or every weekly drudgery, call, you're just like, oh God, oh, you're like dreading it. You're talking to the colleague, your colleagues and you're like, oh God, this is, I just don't, it's time. Or I've, I've had two of those. I've had one back in May where maybe it was June. We're just like, it was like Sunday night. We were going to talk Monday. I just sent him a long email. I just said, look, giving notice. I'm sorry. I just know that we can't make you happy. And he emailed back and was like, that's fine. I appreciate it. And that's good. That's good business. 
They might come yeah. back one day. Many clients have who I've done that with. Right. And conversely, I've had ones where I've gone to the client and gone, I don't know what to do. I'm dreading these calls. And they've gone, me too. And we've actually worked it out. We've had come up with really good ideas. When you have, a, like, that's actually client relations. Right, because you're like honest and forthright and um, engaging for like on a real level, not on a, mm -hmm. this is what I learned in my bad PR class in college. It's, kind of, yeah. it's a really basic thing that people can't do is apologize for example being able to just say i don't know why or just even better i'm sorry let's work out what to do next mm -hmm. most clients frankly won't even fire you they'll try and work they might fire you in a month they'll give you you'll get a little bit of time to work it out but you might get fired or you might quit but for the most part if you just and i wish that managerial types would teach their younger pr people this as well I'm sorry, I don't know is fine. It should be educated. That's fine. You don't know everything. Trying to pretend you do is cancerous. It'll hurt you. Mm -hmm. And frankly, failing is how you get better. And you know what? Sometimes there's nothing to learn. Then we'll, However, I want to yeah. go back to what you said before about that people should be reading and become very engrossed in the industries of the clients they have. So Absolutely. when you get to the point of I don't know, it's because you really went through a lot to get there, not just because you flippantly said, I don't know. I'm, I had one a few months ago where I was like, I honestly don't know. I still don't. It just seemed like a net. It was like a funding announcement. I thought it was going to be rip roaring. It just did not yeah. resonate. And I think it was, I think it's because it was fintech. Fintech's a tough pitch at the moment. A lot of really, yeah. until you're worth a billion or more, no one really cares. Right. And I always thought fintech was going to be an easy sell, and it wasn't. And it, Luckily, the CEO of that company was lovely, though, and he's like, you tried. I'm like, that's fine, yeah. And we'll probably work together in the future. That's the thing. Short-term loss for long-term game is smart business. Mm -hmm. And most clients will appreciate you saying, let's stop now before you burn any more money. I, felt, I had a client come back last week who has come back to me five times because we do short engagements. It's the yeah. best. Fair expectation. I, I have a client like that, too. Where we so started good. off, it was supposed to be a month to month thing. And I went through, you know, first month, it was a, sort of a, a, a launch. And I said to him, I said, I did PR and I brought in a digital um, like marketing agency to help right. on the social side. We sure. went out for the, you know, launched the thing for a month, killed it. I mean, in a, it, it wasn't a huge company or anything. Yeah, but you did, and you I did went, well. And I went back to him and I said, I'm not going to ask you for another month right now. Like, let's put this on pause. And he goes, what are you firing yourself? And I said, yes. I am. Yes. Because I can't do anything for, more for you now. And then a few months later, he came back with like part two and I did it again for a month. And I said, I will, you know, this is, here's the, you know, like the immediate results. I'm going to follow up on you know, whatever it is until it's. Yeah, if someone through. emails me, I'll get back to them. Right. Exactly. Or if something else hits, you know, sometimes these things come out three weeks yeah. later, you never know. Literally just happened to me. <laughs> right. Don't pay me anymore. You paid me for the, like, basically, so now it's basically not a, a retainer. It's a project thing, which is what you had said in the beginning. It's good. So how did you hear about us? I went through um, Kickstarter. I ha I'm a PR agent who has hired an agency. Nice. They introduced me to the podcast. Oh, that's, that's who, awesome. So that's, that's who contacted us, right? And that's the thing. Like, I, I myself don't listen to a lot of podcasts. So especially, frankly, PR ones. Right. This one, though, I was excited to be on. I actually felt frank and honest. Right. Well, <laughs> we try. All right, awesome. Then. Well, I know we've kept you to the street to the hour. Do you have anything else you want to plug, Ed? Just find me on Twitter at Ed Zitron, E-D-Z-I-T-R-O-N. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Ed. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. We have... Oh, I know what we have. 10 embarrassing PR fails that show how not to pitch, which is very apropos. I was just going to say, what apropos, what a perfect, the apropos is apropos. Yeah, it's so, so <laughs> on brand for this podcast. All right. Let's see what we got. So it's, what, it's the top 10. Embarrassing PR fails that show how not to pitch. Okay, let's go through it and maybe we could say, what we if we think that ed would agree or disagree i like this okay so you want to go to do 10 we'll go down yeah. 10 to one yep. you do 10 and then i'll do nine 
Perfect. By the way, for our listeners, we're reading an article from the nextweb.com. So we have a tweet from John Christian. Someone yeah. literally- So wait, John Christian, I want to say, I just looked him up. He is the news editor of Futurism, and he's also seen in the Boston Globe, Vice, and Wired. Okay, so this adds some context. Yeah. He said- as someone literally sent me a press release about how a CEO they represent had tweeted something at Elon Musk. I checked, and number one, Elon didn't reply. And number two, the tweet only got three favorites. Um, so that, that is so unbelievable. So somebody just said, my CEO tweeted at Elon Musk, and that he thought that would be of interest to this very high-level journalist. In a press release form. Oh, it was in a, pr wow. Not only just a little <laughs> note, like, hey, isn't it funny that my CEO tweeted at Elon Musk, they put a press release out? Okay. Amazing. So, so what, what did I say? Would Ed um, agree or disagree with this? I mean, yes. I think Ed would say this, I'm not even gonna respond to this, that's just lunacy. Yeah, he would be furious. <laughs> but I'm yeah, sure that somebody's senior manager told them to do it and then they had to do it. Yeah. Okay, number nine, being a jerk. All right, so uh, this is another tweet from Sophia Waterfield, who sure. writes for a bunch of outlets such as Newsweek, New Scientist, Forbes, and Metro UK. This was her tweet. So I was told by a PR from a major tech corporation to check other security journalists' work when I asked for a statement. Is this a new thing? What? Okay, so wait, this is bringing me back. And I think I blocked it out because I can only have a vague memory of it where, and I can't remember where I was or who it was, but I remember in the sort of recent past, a client telling us to tell the other reporters to read Bloomberg because he had been interviewed in Bloomberg and that he wasn't gonna do an interview with these reporters, even though we were actively pitching and getting interview requests, mm -hmm. he said, just give them the Bloomberg story. Oh. I think it's similar to this. So again, what would Ed say? Ed would say, I'm not even responding. This is no, he would be furious. Um, no, and you should never mention, I mean, if your client has gotten coverage in something that's like a trade publication that's not a competitor or business journal or the local newspaper or something like that and it can lend to a pitch to a national then maybe then could you mention but you don't tell the reporter to go check other but go you go never. find go find it so this is what i was talking about this before yes if you never. get like a trade a good trade story or even a good financial story, you might then want to use that print story, even if it's online print, to try to get broadcast and say, look, Bloomberg. I thought, wrote right, about I thought this. you would be interested. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Do you want him on your radio show, podcast, TV show? You can do that, usually. Yeah. But yeah. to say to a reporter, you, no. go check out what your competition wrote and you know, let us know. Oh my God, why are you, so what so what Ed was saying, like, why are you even doing this for a living? Right. Oh, and okay, eight is even better. You're going to be excited. Oh my goodness. Being a real jerk. Okay. So this is from Oscar Williams Grutt, who is a senior city correspondent at Yahoo Finance. He did not name the company. He says, lovely interaction with a Netflix PR who refused to send me a statement on Harry and Meghan deal and said, you're a journalist. You should be able to find that out when I asked for their press contact details. And then someone says I'm uh, below that. This is actually very similar to the response I feel I'm getting when I search for a film genre. So it's very on brand. That's from Mike Bird. I, I don't even know what to say. I, I, can't, I can't form words. My mouth just froze open. I, I can't, it's not even funny it's so bad. Why, again, why are you a PR person? That's unbelievable. It's like when you go to like a store and you're at the cash register or whatever and you know the person hates their job. It's like, I'm just here to buy this product. Like, why are you mad at me? Like, this is your job. 
I can't, I'm not even, I, I gotta move on because it's making me mad. This one's worse. Undervalue others work is number seven. And there's a tweet from James Cook, who's a special correspondent at The Telegraph. And it says, somebody tweeted at him, hey James, I am the founder of slaughterandfox.com. Do you think you can handle the London PR for us and get a feature in The Telegraph? Thanks. <laughs> and James Cook tweeted, you know, and commented, I don't think it works like this, which is hilarious. What the hell? So that, in my opinion, is clearly not a PR person who works at the- There's no way, please God, there's Fox. no way. And somebody at Slaughter and Fox said to their assistant or whatever, oh, go, you know, get in touch with the Telegraph and tell them to run a story on this because nobody knew what the hell PR was. So I'm not even putting this on the this, this can't have been a PR move. No, okay, let's just move on. That's just so, that just makes me nauseous. Okay, making up things. This is from Mike Butcher. Who's he right for? He's the editor at large at TechCrunch. Thank you. Okay. So Mike Butcher, editor in the editor at large at TechCrunch says, please don't send me a press release saying you are quote, helping UK startups during hashtag COVID 2019 by basically doing what your company did anyway. Oh my Lord. Wait, are they really, are they really COVID. using, are they really using that or is he just, did he, was that a type on his end? I don't even know what this means. I think that what he's saying is that he's getting all these press releases from companies that are doing exactly what they were doing already. At, and, and claiming they're, that they're, they're framing doing it for like, COVID, oh, but they yeah. were doing it anyway. But is their business model and thing that something they were doing anyway? Well, the thing I'm confused is the hashtag is COVID 2019. I think that was a mistake on his end. All right, I'm moving on. So number okay. five, copying others and doing it too late. So I'm reading a text from Adrian Bridgewater, who is a tech journalist um, for Computer Weekly, Forbes, IDG. This is obviously a UK story we're going over. So dear PR and comms world, are we agreed that, quote, my client's software will now be free for humanitarian causes in light of COVID-19, unquote, is a wonderful but B, no longer something you need to send us a press release about. Hashtag journal request. Hey, Jack, ain't no thing but a chicken wing. So I guess, I guess he's over the like whole COVID-19 pitching. Sounds very similar. That's, yeah, that's good information. I bet he meant to say COVID-19 in the, in the top one. Instead of Kuth, yeah. Yeah, kind of instead of 2019, just sort of have a, a, a glitch. Okay, so number four, making the journalist's job harder. This is from Andrew Elson. No to PRs, please, please don't send press releases and PDFs. Nothing more annoying than realizing at nearly 6 p.m. that I have to write it out, that quote from your boss, because it won't let me cut and paste. Arg. <laughs> okay, that's actually, that's hilarious that anybody would do that, but also actually useful information if you're young and you don't know better. Go and look to nicer in a PDF quote. and it's easier for everyone to open it. Like, no. Well, the other reason I do PDF sometimes is because you don't want anybody to um, edit your press release on purpose or by accident. Yeah, but how annoying for the reporters. I actually rarely send attachments at all, to be honest with you. I like having the hyperlinks to the press release online. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. It, when possible. Interesting. This one is very sort of transactional. I would think that Ed would say, fine. The next one, this is from Suraj Shah, a contributor of Forbes. He said, I've had a follow-up from a PR two hours after original email has been sent three times today from different agencies. What on earth is going on? <laughs> and this is the being way too pushy. Right. So I have Usually, you know, if I'm sending like a bunch of pitches out, I'll send a pitch out and wait a couple of days and then send a follow up. And then if I don't hear back from them, I am, I'm done. Right. Okay. Why is he also getting a pitch from different agencies? Right. I bet it's because it was probably a, a, an announcement that had more than one company involved and they did not do a good job of dividing up the media list. That sounds right. Okay. That's, uh, that sounds plausible. I can buy but that. so that's why he's getting so many follow-ups one after the other, but 
I, I have worked for people who are like, did you follow up? Did you follow up with them? I'm like, well, I just sent it, you know, yesterday at one in the afternoon. It's nine the next day. Follow up again. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> You're going to love the next one. Okay. Manipulating with exclusives. A PR just emailed to offer me an exclusive and to say I was on top of their list. But to make it even better, they revealed the next two journalists in order to be pitched. Should I decline? I like and encourage this approach wholeheartedly. <laughs> this is from Steve O'Hare, or O'Hare, who is a journalist at TechCrunch covering oh European God. startups. So he was like, if you don't cover it, I'm going to contact your competitor at uh, the Wall Street Journal and, and Fortune or something. That's incredible. It's awesome. Yeah, don't do that. All right, are you ready to uh, drum yes, roll the number, number one. one? Not doing your homework. This is from Charlotte G, who is a journalist from MIT Technology. She says, a PR person has emailed me to offer me an interview with my own mum, and I'm quite literally crying with laughter. And then she pays the email. Hi, Compoli Global, the leading RegTech AMI specialist, has entered into a strategic partnership with Comply Advantage to take the fight to fraudsters and money launderers. It follows as the company recently unveiled Complete QED, the most comprehensive remote corporate onboarding platform. This comes as criminals are taking advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to carry out financial fraud and exploitation scams, and they are becoming more expert at finding loopholes in existing systems. We are including the full story below. If you would like to hear more, we can also offer you some time with Jane G, CEO of Complete Global, in the form of a comment or interview. Does this sound of interest? Many thanks. Okay, well, that's funny, but I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that the PR person would know that Jane and Charlotte may have the same last name that they're related, but it's funny. It is funny. That is funny. It is funny. That's I ha a good so one. I have a story. I went to grad school for journalism and the class, the first class and truthfully, the only class that I took was, I think his name was Leslie Seifert. I wonder if he's still around, the professor. I can't believe I remember that. And the journalism class he decided was going to base, be based on local politics. And you had to go to your local council meetings and you know write up the news that they were discussing. Now, this was at Columbia, so most of the students were in New York, so they were going to like you know their local area council meetings in whatever neighborhood they lived in. Well, I still lived at home, so I lived in, you know, the small town that I was from in New Jersey where my father happened to be the mayor. <laughs> so I wrote the articles for the class and he read them all, whatever, and he's giving them back to everybody. This is like, you know, I don't even know how kids do this now. You actually typed out the paper and printed it out and handed it to the professor and he read it and marked it in red and it was a grade on it. And in the middle of the class, he's giving every, you know, here, Bob, here, Mike, here, Sue. And then he's like, Laura, did you know that the mayor of the town you're from has the same last name as you? And I said, you're kidding me. And he's like, oh man. And I said, I didn't make up the syllabus for this class. I had no idea. I didn't know that this was what he was, you know? And so he was like mad that I was like, I didn't even have to go to the meetings. My dad came home and threw the minutes at me. I mean, <laughs> funny. So anyway, that's why he didn't realize necessarily that I was my father's daughter, such as this PR person. Right. right. I yeah, always figure out a way to bring it back to me. I think that went sort of, yeah. I think if it's easy to find that out by doing research, then, then shame on that person. And otherwise, well, it's just funny. It's a funny coincidence. Yeah. It's worth putting first, even though it's not actually the worst of, of this list. No. What do you think is the worst? Oh, I think the one, the one or two where they're like, to the reporter, yeah, can you go, why don't you go find out, like, you know, about that's awful. this. Yeah, that's awful. What, you don't know? You're a reporter, you should know. <laughs> terrible, that is terrible. That's crazy, all right. Okay, I think it's a wrap. Do we have anything else we wanna mention for our listeners? I don't think so. I think I've given all of the information that I have at my disposal today. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in for the PR Wind Down podcast. And many thanks to our guest, Ed, for joining us today. We had a entertaining and 
informationally rich interview. Yes, it was great. Hey, remember to submit your own agency stories and questions. That means you could do both a horror story or you could submit a question. Hey, how would you handle this scenario? Almost like a write-in for the, the, the elder advice. <laughs> and as always, we appreciate your support. So please share our show with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating, ideally five stars. We cannot wait to wind down with you again next week. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye.